Father, we thank you for uh, the, your word and its power to address our every single need and every uh, concern and instinct and challenge in the uh, faith and in the church and in our families. We are blessed, Lord, that you've given us such great instruction. Help us to love it and uh, seek to obey it and today in this hour to understand it in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're looking at liberty of conscience. What a, uh, what a concept. So we, uh, in the first week, quick review, we looked at liberty as defined by the dictionary. And what was that uh, definition? All of the definitions you can find online, all the defin definitions in the dictionary say what? Liberty is freedom from constraint. No rules, just right. And uh, we know as believers that is uh, bankrupt and uh, can't ever lead us to any. Uh, yet yet it, is, it is the mantra of our age and it's, it's, the, uh, it's the message of uh, all pop music and not all rap music though, Cody. <laughs> Some of it's godly I've recently learned. No, that's... And then we summed up last week by trying to look at, okay, what it, in that statement of confession, we see 15 defining elements of freedom on the plus side, access to God. And I, I, I interpret all of those statements as freedom to seek and obey. And I interpret all of those on the negative side, freedom from the grip of sin and bondage to sin uh, so so that's that's a really important foundation because the question in the heart of every young person and many foolish middle-aged people who haven't learned it is uh, how shall I use my freedom uh, in fact we'll dig into that just a little bit tonight in the men's group and it's going to be that's going to be a really fun discussion too uh, so 21-2, here's this uh, much shorter than last week confession, thank, thankfully. Uh, who would read that for me? Got it. You're going to have to play along. I'm super distracted with my sewer crisis, so I'm going to need all of your support today. Yeah. Okay. God alone is Lord's conscience, and he has let it... He has left it free from human doctrines and commandments that are in any way contrary to his word or not contained in it. So believing such doctrines or obeying such commands out of conscience is a betrayal of true liberty of conscience. Requiring implicit faith for absolute and blind obedience destroys liberty of conscience and reason as well. You'd think believers over time would grow sufficiently to understand what the scripture teaches about liberty and liberty of conscience. But I find that believers who have been in church for 40 years, many are not any more mature than the believer who just got off of heroin and stumbled into the church. Uh, I'm having the wonderful experience of getting to uh, counsel a young meth addict at Life Choices. And uh, this week I had from um, Teen challenge a young man in my office, and just the love of Christ was beaming out of his face. He just, I could tell he had been transformed uh, by the power of God, and he, we just had a wonderful conversation, and I got to pray with him. And the, the, the state of mind of these young addicts They've explored liberty on their own terms and found all the terrible consequences of liberty. And yet inside the church, we have people who express, explore and express their liberty in ways that are, okay, not as destructive as meth, but certainly cause intense uh, conflict in the church as they try to apply uh, a standard they, they've developed a conviction about, I think it's re this passage is really important and you need to do this. And now I'm going to judge you because you don't do this the way I do this. And we, we get on a train that uh, separates us from uh, what it means to walk in 
real liberty. So let's take these one at a time as we do. Uh, God alone is Lord of the conscience. If only that statement alone could define the way we think and live, uh, we would be different people. I would be different. I, these, every one of these studies every week challenges me as deeply as it challenges you. I don't, uh, I don't ever stand up here or in the pulpit and present something that has not shaken me to my core as I consider how far I am from the truth of Scripture in my framework of convictions. God alone is the Lord of the conscience. And so uh, if you would, Mags, would you read that first, first uh, James 4, 12? There's only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to, dis- to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbors? Simple enough. Does it make you think of all the tattoos that say only God can judge me? It does me. I... If you Google that, you will find hundreds of them. That is one of the most popular tattoos out there. But what are people thinking when they tattoo that on themselves? What is their conviction? Why do they say it? Is it out of a respect for God's sovereign and righteous judgment over all things, including my choices? Probably not. Yeah, probably not. So what are they saying you're not the boss of me. You're not the boss of me. Yeah. Yeah. How dare you judge me? How dare you? Is that a judgment? It's 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 a it's a it's a specially uh, great judgment when they misspell it. And you can find several of those because then they're wearing their stupidity right out there for us to see. No regrets. If only we could teach and convey what a righteous respect for the judgment of God is. What a terrifying thing it is to uh, face God with our own righteousness. And yet that's our instinct for many of us inside the church. Romans, yes? Is this saying something like, since God made the conscience, he can judge it. And and so, yeah, this is talking to the believers. I guess I'm trying to understand from the confession standpoint. Are they writing this because they're saying, I'm not supposed to be the Holy Spirit for somebody else? Yes, and I, I believe it's addressing every believer and every church leader, every elder and deacon. Because we're just great at manufacturing laws that we want you to follow so that you do a better job of supporting everything I want to do. So that you will pay me more or grant me what I wish as your supreme sovereign imperial commander in the I listened to an interview yesterday with uh, Ginger Duggar, one of the 19 kids in County Kids. Mm-hmm. And she's written a book called, I think it's called Freedom from Fear or something to that effect is the name of the book. But she's very respectful of her parents as she speaks. She's not just Good. She's not just Because some of those Duggars have not been. Uh, right. Well, what I saw. I mean, she maybe she's not all the time, but in this one she was. And she was just talking about how her family... Uh, subscribe to all the Bill Gothard ministries and, and yep. his type of brand of legalism in their Christianity and um, how it produced so much fear in, in them growing up of just that you know, their actions and their, you know, exactly what they wore, exactly what he thought they should you know, this brand of courtship and this, you know, all these things yep. that are outside of scripture um, imposed on them, even led them to, you know, that they couldn't even go to a church because no one subscribed in quite the right way, so they just had to do home church and they would just listen to the sermons on Sunday morning. Wow. You know, that it was so ingrained in them that it led to so much fear that what she was saying was exactly this, that when when I was faced with the freedom of the gospel and the freedom of conscience in, you know, loving God, that it was just this weight off of me to understand that live in freedom in him but it was a really beautiful testimony but I think we all do it I think as parents too we even do it here we want our kids to do certain things and we do have to make rules and then we have to be careful how we make that rule in our home that it's not to please the Lord that he's more pleased with me if I choose this one garment in the store but that it's a bigger issue than that you know in all of our lives it's hard 
separate the two and not be legalistic. The crossover between this content and what we're going to talk about tonight is just really great. Thank you for saying that. Well, the crossover between this content and what's in the sermon this morning, um, I'm just thinking. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Okay, how, what can I amend? What can I get out of that? So I'm just how thinking. God wants to speak to us. And we continually marvel over how these connections are made. And we have not talked one, de- one time this week about what he's going to speak about or what this lesson was on. And, and I'm just I'm so humbled by seeing God at work all around me in the craziest circumstances and the greatest blessings and weird trash like this morning. He is so good and merciful, and he is at work in my mess, and I'm so grateful for that. Romans 14, 4, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Isaiah 33, 22, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, The Lord is our king, and he will save us. I went to to revisit your thought, Sherry, which I thought was excellent. I went to some Bill Gothard seminars when I was a teenager. But I didn't, you know, abandon everything I thought previously and stop attending church and read only his books and listen only to his recordings. And I... But I remember gaining some things that changed my life. Like to this young, recently liberated addict who sat in my office on Friday from Teen Challenge. I just started telling him, and I don't even know what motivated it, but I know it was the Lord because as soon as I said these things, tears just started running down his face and I could see he was in exactly the same place. And I said that You know, and if you've already heard my early part of my testimony, forgive me, you're probably sick of it. I grew up so distant from my dad, who was so cold and unloving. Couldn't I? I'm not sure I heard him say the words "I love you" till maybe I was 40. He was just so aloof, so broken, so cold. He just could not express affection, and I needed it desperately. And so I just thought he hated me, or didn't give a rip if I lived or died. And I remember an awakening, and it came from something I heard Bill Gothard say, which was, on the day that you stop comparing your dad or your broken mother to that ideal in your head, and you start comparing that parent to the example they were given, you can't be liberated. I mean, light bulbs went on for me when I heard that teaching. It changed everything. When I was 18, I asked my dad, so what about your dad? I met him when he was in his coffin. I mean, literally, we drove to a funeral in Texas, and he said, there's your grandpa. Goodbye, grandpa. That was our relationship. Never spoke of it again. I was 12. Never spoke of it again. Who was he? What does he stand for? What did he achieve in life? What did he do for a living? I didn't know any of that. When he was 18, when I was 18, on my 18th birthday, in fact, he came in my, my room, swung open the door, said, you need to get up and go to school. I said, why? You know, and I just was in a mood to argue, so we argued for a few minutes about going to school. I'm sure none of you ever argue about stupid stuff with your parents, never. <laughs> but I'm a master at it, so if you need some strategies, come see me afterwards, and I can tell you some really stupid things to say that would put you in a bad situation. And I said, hey, I just want to know, what was it with your dad? Why did we meet him in his coffin and you never talk about him? We don't know anything about him. It's not right. It's not fair. Why, why is there no connection to our past? What, what's the big secret? Was he a spy? Was he a... What, 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 what was it about? And I saw a tear come down his face. First one I'd ever seen in my life. I thought he was born without tear ducts. I was really shocked. And then he told me the story of his alcoholic, abusive father who so savagely abused him and his mother that they moved off and he escaped when he was 15 to get away from this drunken, abusive father. And I'm telling you, 
everything I heard Bill Gothard say as a teenager just became alive to me, just on this one topic. Not everything he says, I'm not saying that. But the reality that I had always compared him to Hugh Beaumont, who played Leave it to Beaver's father. You know, this idealized, perfect dad in my brain. That's who I wanted. My dad was none of that, and I, I was justified in hating him because he was so imperfect until that teaching, that truth, that angle woke me up to, wait, if I compare him to his father, he's a completely different man. This story is very different from the, whole, the story I told myself growing up. My dad never cheated on my mom. My dad would not touch alcohol for the express reason that he did not want to become an addict, and I think he thought I might, so I'm not going to touch it because he saw the damage that alcohol did in his father's life. That's not suggesting that if you drink alcohol, there's anything wrong. He uh, taught us how to work. He taught every one of us how to be creative, entrepreneurial. He taught us carpentry skills and electrical skills, and he really worked hard and taught all of us to work hard and... I mean, I have a list. I gave this young man sitting in my office ten things. These are all the virtues of my father, which I couldn't see as long as I was blinded by this stupid picture in my head that wasn't real. So uh, my point is to say that he, he can liberate us from the falsehoods that we have believed and operated upon and pressed onto other people and uh, that is a that's a powerful thing to pursue for your own life that liberty to be liberated from lies that you have told yourself that's pretty great that's pretty sweet that's pretty wonderful Uh, God alone is the Lord of the conscience Uh, so then finally Matthew 10 28 and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in heaven, in hell. Back to James 4. Only one lawgiver, only one judge. He who is able to save and destroy. And so why do we bounce around calibrating our conscience by every new teacher we hear and every new influencer we meet and every new book we read and every new... If God alone is the Lord of our conscience seeking to understand his will and seeking to obey his will becomes our great passion. Greater than buying our next house. (laughs) Greater than getting our next promotion. Greater than completing that degree. Greater than every other pursuit. The second statement, and he has left it free from human doctrines and commandments that they are in any way contrary to his word or not contained in it. What? And he has left it free. What was the first statement? God alone is the Lord of the conscience. And he has left it free from human doctrines and commandments that are in any way contrary to his word or not contained in it. What is he saying? Anybody want to venture a guess? And I'm not looking for an answer I can smack down. I just, I, I read this and it, it's challenging. It's a continual question about when you think your conscience is telling you something. Is that actually the conscience that Christ, that God gave you? Or is that something you've been, it's been uh, imprinted on you from your relationship? It's a great question to ask yourself every day, Noni. Thank you. Acts 4, 18 through 20. Uh, Caleb, you want to read that? So they called them and charged charged them not to speak or teach. All this, sorry. <laughs> You're fine. So you want this coffee here, I'll bring it to you. <laughs> so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to your to you rather than to God, you must not must judge, for we cannot but but speak of what we have seen and heard. Okay, open to Acts four if you have your Bible. In every one of these passages, uh, 
quoting Jesus, were addressing the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. I, it pains me to see that the biggest enemies to the will and purpose of God in Christ's ministry were religious people. The prostitutes and drug addicts on the streets were not his biggest problem, clearly. Then Peter, in verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a deed, good deed done to a crippled man, we're reasoning Christian duty. 13, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated common men. They were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Really, that's it? That's what they had? That was their advantage? They didn't recognize that they'd completed a seminary degree. Nothing critical of that. So, verse 18, they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of of Jesus. The world and plenty of religious idiots will attempt to see you act religiously or dutifully or spiritually or in con- accordance with church policy or practice, but not in the name of Jesus. Please, not in the name of Jesus. Please. Don't talk so much about Jesus. We are pressed in the church as much as outside the church to conform our conscience, as you were suggesting, Noni, to standards dreamed up by clever men and women that are not biblical and not honoring to the name of Christ. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7.23, you were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. Yet what do we have in the modern church exactly as they had in the New Testament church? Armies of followers who act and teach and speak and march and build in the name of, fill in the blank, of popular We make ourselves bond servants of causes and movements and men like it's our job. That is, we're so instinctively drawn to get on board and build something. That's why the, forgive me if this sounds at all self-serving, but I have thought in this past year that Scott and Randy better get their act together and really lay out a vision for the next five years for our church. And all that nonsense comes from, you know, business practices and business thinking and business strategy and business planning and business. That these two guys do not want you to do anything in our name or build anything because we told you to or obey because we're doing it Scott or Randy's way or we're building on a foundation they've, imagined or constructed. That might be the best thing we've done in the past year. Is just to step out of the spot of power broker, follow me and do what I say, and then something great's going to happen here. Because that's the clarion call of virtually every religious leader you can find. Follow me and we're going to build something great. I heard a few great sermons years ago by the guy who is now pastor of the largest church in America. He's in Oklahoma City. (laughs) I'm reading the Bible that his church published, and uh, you probably have it on your phone. Some great things have been done by that church, but I am terrified by anybody who has now 36 locations all listening to his voice every Sunday morning and recording. That's kind of terrifying. That's a lot of eggs in one basket. That's a lot of trust in one man's vision. That's a lot of, that's a lot. And that he nearly suffered a nervous breakdown a year and a half ago. And I don't know if you follow any of that. I know several people who go to that church, one of its 36 locations. 
It's no wonder no one could bear that much burden and responsibility. If he doesn't paint a picture of what it is we must do, if he doesn't define conscience and establish commandments really literally in his own shadow, then I I don't know if that church functions. And the proof will not be any judgment from me. The proof will be if he dies and the church goes right on or is removed or whatever happens. If he's gone and the church misses not one step but moves forward, then he was on the right track. But if he leaves the pulpit, if he retires or dies or whatever, and the whole house of cards collapses, it was a house of cards. But maybe I think it's, it's, it is both the congregation and the pastor's responsibility to make sure they're not doing this. Like just, I grew up in the same thing that the Duggars grew up in, and I'm grateful my parents specifically said, we're not going to be Gothardites. We're not. We're not following him. We're following what the Lord says, and it looks like this is in Scripture, so we're going to do that. Right. And I, they weren't going to be of Apollos or of Paul or right. Doug Wilson or of any. They were going to be make sure it's right. And I think that's the as believers, we've got to make sure we do that as a congregation, the family, individual units. But then also the pastor or anybody in that role. Yeah, you better be making sure that you're not just calling for following I love that the burden is on both of us it is on both of us and that is why we're doing a survey the burden is on you to say hey I'm concerned about something Scott preached of course I would use him as my example (laughs) I'm concerned about something you said I disagree with something you guys decided that really is I'm not sure that's biblical the burden is on both of us I agree And if we're continually looking for, and you asking, but where in Scripture do you find that? You just said that like it's the truth. Now can you back it up? That's that's the experience we had. uh, Not wanting to... The world is full of people who are bouncing from hating on this preacher and hating on this movement and hating on this church and hating on that guy and that guy, not looking for anything but uh, some sense of superiority because we didn't fall into that trap and we didn't fall into that trap and we didn't fall into that. Are you in love with Jesus? That's my question. I I, I don't really care if you're reformed or not. I don't really care if you're a Paul or Apollos. I don't care if you have a background that includes this teacher or that teacher. I want to know do you love Jesus and Are you seeking him? And are you seeking to weigh everything taught and said and preached by Scripture? Do you take notes and then go home and look that up and ponder? Is that really what the Scripture says? Is that really what it means? You should. I do. That's what led me to ask many questions. Get myself in trouble. Get myself a stupid assignment. Matthew 15, 8 to 9. This people, why are there two sets of quotes? Open your Bibles to Matthew 15. Why are there two sets of quotes? Yes, Jesus is quoting Isaiah. And again, he is arguing with the Pharisees and scribes. I love it. His arguments with the religious leaders should empower you to ask questions not make you afraid of it. Why is it we're so intimidated? In the season of this survey, I'll tell you that someone said to me a few weeks ago, you know, I think think people don't engage at Trinity any more than they do because they're afraid that you guys will judge them as not as mature as you are or not as gifted as you are or And I want to laugh and say that's ridiculous. But if that's a perception, we need to understand it and address it. And for whatever damage this might do, I apologize. But 
thank you women for speaking up in this classroom. I have no problem with you speaking up and asking questions and participating in this conversation. No problem whatsoever. So Jesus says, this people honors me with their lips, quoting Isaiah, but their heart is far from me in vain. They do worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. I just see this and I think, how true was that in Isaiah's time? Such a different time from when Jesus was speaking to the scribes and Pharisees. How true was it when Jesus said it, quoted it, and how true is it today as we sit here in this classroom and look at the Word of God? Don't be conformed to this world, and this world, the definition of this world includes a bunch of religious zealot ideology that would bind your conscience. Number, uh, the, the third statement, and oh, there's just so much good here. Personal freedom and liberty of conscience must be built upon the foundation of spiritual freedom. There is no liberty of conscience without gospel liberation. We ought to thank God for the climate of freedom from papal and rabbinical and Marxist tradition in which we live. The dignity and freedom of the individual Christian man is the foundation of the whole fabric of our society. Yes, I read and I listen and I watch and I'm concerned about our government and certain leaders in our government who don't respect Christian liberty or liberty of conscience in any way on any level. And I'm as concerned as you are. But admit it, with our southern border wide open, millions are fighting to get in, not out. This remains the freest, most incredibly wonderful place on earth to live in which to find and express liberty. Uh, so, this is the next uh, statement. Believing such doctrines or obeying such commands out of conscience is a betrayal of the true liberty of conscience. Again, so believing such doctrines or obeying such commands out of conscience is a betrayal of true liberty of conscience. What is he saying? What are they saying? If you're obedient to a teacher out of conscience... Let's see if we can flush that out. Colossians 2, 20 through 23. None of you want to read that? If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used. According to human precepts and teachings, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and aestheticism, sorry, and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Um, that's a great place to just let that thought linger. Old Testament, New Testament, modern age, these truths are transcendent. You will be encouraged, or in many circles, much more strongly than that, compelled to be bound to the teachings of men. Do not touch, touch taste, handle. And so is the call to liberty then, the call to live with no boundaries whatsoever and indulge in whatever pleases you there must be there must be a healthy place for a believer to stand neither binding his conscience to a man nor acting with a conscience that can be defined by any whim of himself or his pastor that's what I'm praying for you as we look at these passages yes sir this legalism goes back to the garden when God said, don't eat the fruit. And they said, don't eat the fruit, don't look at the fruit, don't touch it, don't, don't go, go near the tree. It. We're going to build yeah. a fence around the tree. And they added to, to God's law. God said, enjoy this, love this, sit sit under you know the, the shade and, and look at the beauty. Enjoy it. Don't don't eat it. And they said, mm, okay, we're going to take your rule. And they a whole bunch of law around. Yeah. 
steal that. So to defy it or to redefine it is an instinct every one of us has and we need to be aware of it. Both followers and leaders, we're all inclined to that. Uh, thank you. And uh, you're doing such a good job. Why don't you close us in prayer? <laughs> Father, uh, thank you for thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for this church and, and our, our desire to love us. To, to seek after you. To love you. And to, to, find, to find enjoyment in, in you. And I ask is that you come to make all of us aware of be put in place uh, not to love you but to, to love ourselves and to, to give us that, that freedom to, to seek you in all that we do Lord thank you for the Holy Spirit that, that gives us a conscience and, and, and directs us in how we, how we live and work and pray I just ask that we continue to, to look to you for that Amen. See you out there. Nine minutes. Let's go. Preacher.